8.40 a.m. Eastern here on C-SPAN 2. Now we go live to Capitol Hill where the House Rules Committee is meeting to set the guidelines for debate on managed health care, including what amendments will be allowed. The hearing got underway just after 8 p.m. Eastern, then took a break for a series of four votes in the House. And it just resumed a few minutes ago. Discussing and have before us the one-page outline of the agreement uh, that you and President Bush and Speaker Hastert uh, have worked on, and we want to congratulate you uh, on this. And uh, I'd like to say that uh, there's some kind of whistling going on around here. I don't know what that is. Is that you, Quinn? I don't know what the problem is here, but our technical expert, I, I don't know if it's someone's cell phone or. Is there anyone who might be able to adjust that or? I don't think it's anything that's regularly in the rules committee. <laughs> regularly, we. No, I don't, I don't, I don't have that. I think the other people here may have it. Well, let's uh, proceed now, and uh, I don't hear the whistling any longer. Uh, and uh, Mr. Norwood, we're very happy to have you, and if you'd like to uh, begin your testimony, and I know there'll be a number of questions from uh, members of the panel. Congratulations, thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the purpose of, the reason I'm here is that uh, my intention is to have an amendment to amend H.R. 2563, and in particular and only in the area of uh, liability. Uh, we don't have language, language to offer you right now, though it is uh, being written as rapidly as, as uh, smart people can do. And do you want to hear basically what this amendment is about? I'd like about? to outline that for us. Uh, we, again, let me just say that uh, you're familiar with this one-page outline that uh, has been provided. I think I've, I, yeah, I've seen think that. You, I, yeah, think, yeah. I think you've probably got a copy of that. So that's been distributed. If you want to expand on that at all, we certainly would. Well, I think I can narrow this down pretty easily. The purpose of this, uh, in my whole mission in all of this, uh, was try to find a way that the President of the United States could sign into law a uh, patient protections bill, one of which I happen to believe 2563 is a good one. Uh, I think the other men at this table, uh, I think we've all put together a very good bill. However, it, it, the President of the United States does indeed have a right to have some say so about what goes into uh, any final result that we have, and it is my belief that uh, for us to get it signed, we have to pay some attention to him. We, what we've done in terms of, and, and it's basically this, we, we've, we're going to ask for a federal cause of action uh, for failure to exercise ordinary care and the denial and delay of a benefit. Uh, what that basically means in simple terms is that the employers that are uh, self-insured and self-administered uh, would go then to federal court for this federal cause of action. But this federally defined cause of action would also apply in state court uh, for which other employers and HMOs would then go into state court using state rules and procedures uh, for this particular and only this cause of action. Part of what is very important here to me, uh, very important, and to the President is that we, in writing this language, don't want to get in a position where we have preempted other state causes of actions at the state level. That's very critical to final fruition uh, of this in my mind. Um, that, that is the, the crux of it. We've, we've discussed different things that concern the President, and he insist that any legislation that he would sign would have to have limitations on liabilities. Uh, and I think we've heard from him 
perhaps before that uh, he wanted a $500,000 cap. Uh, that was not something that was uh, agreed to. We did end up agreeing on a $1.5 million cap uh, in punitive damages and a $1.5 million cap on non-economic damages. Uh, the other change from uh, what is in 2563 is that the uh, external review panel may well rule in favor of the insurance company saying this is or this is not medically necessary. And in 2563, the patient, the, a patient that is harmed then has the right uh, to go on and take this case under 2563 in, in state court. Uh, we're saying, the president is saying, that if a insurance company does everything that they could know to do, including following the uh, dictates of the external review, then that uh, particular insurance company should not be held liable. We, uh, we don't agree with that in 2563, and the compromise there basically was that they can still go to court as opposed to not being able to go at all, which is where the White House wanted to go, and they would give to the insurance company a presumption, a rebuttable presumption that uh, they were not wrong. They didn't do anything wrong. Uh, those of you that are lawyers can describe and deal with that in a little better way than I can. But the idea here, and what I was trying to do, is to make sure we didn't lose the ability for an injured patient to have a remedy even when the insurance company did precisely uh, what the uh, external review panel said do. Uh, part, of the, part of the difficulty there for a physician or a doctor is that if the physician diagnoses a patient and says we need to uh, have a certain treatment, a certain surgery, whatever, and the insurance company says, no, we don't believe you need to do that. And then the uh, external review upholds the plan. Uh, the patient would have no recourse if they were harmed, but the, there would be plenty of recourse to then take the physician into court who did no wrong at all, simply said this is the treatment and nobody allowed him to do it. So we feel it's a little bit fairer to not let the insurance industry totally off the hook, but we also are, are aware of the difficulty for them when they've done everything that they have been told to do. That's basically the change uh, that we're talking about making. Thank you very much. I think that you've uh, clearly explained the modification. As you've pointed out, the greatest area of uh, disagreement was in the area of the liability provisions, and I think that uh, this clearly is a compromise. And again, I congratulate you on your, your work on this. One last point, if I may. The, the value of this, particularly if we don't preempt other causes of action in, in states now, is that when this is signed into law, it immediately gives patients in all 50 states a, a cause of action in the denial or the delay of a benefit. And to me, there is great value in that in that immediately people have a recourse that they have not had for the last uh, 30 years. Mr. Dingell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm delighted to appear here with my three good friends. Uh, I ask unanimous consent that I be permitted to insert into the record my statement, which I had prepared for my appearance here. Without objection, it'll uh, it be entered in the record. It is somewhat dated by reason of events that have transpired more <laughs> recently, and I suspect that, that its inclusion in the record would be valuable, and if, if you all are minded, you may even wish to use it sometime for reading material over the recess. Its relevance has declined significantly. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I express before I begin my great affection and respect for all of the three gentlemen who appear here at the table with me. Uh, and I want to recite the events which have transpired today and what they might mean in connection with the rule. Uh, I noted that the committee 
said that no amendments would be considered for purposes of being offered on the floor unless they had been submitted with 55 copies prior to the 5 o'clock deadline, which was fixed by this committee. I am not sure uh, whether the committee is, is or was serious about that, but I would expect that, that I would hear from the chair that, that the committee does intend vigorously to enforce the rule and that all members who are, are, are concerned about this legislation would have equal opportunities if to I, offer if I might, amendments. Uh, if I might respond, then I'd, I'd be happy to read the statement uh, which I uh, stated on the House floor, which is not quite as the gentleman stated it. I'd be happy to listen to it then, Mr. Chairman. Well, uh, basically what I said is that uh, in light of the fact that we uh, might uh, consider a structured rule on this, I said members should submit their amendments to the Rules Committee by 5 p.m. There is no rule of the House that makes a requirement uh, for setting that. And that's simply, that's simply a guide that I put forward, and I will tell you that Democrats and Republicans alike have on occasion been known to submit amendments uh, beyond the stated period of time. And so I just I think that members of the minority will know full well that it's not unusual for the Rules Committee to fashion a rule with consideration of certainly extraordinary uh, recommendations that have come from the Speaker of the House of Representatives, the President of the United States, and one of the lead authors of very important legislation. Well, let me then suggest, in the interest of brevity, that, that the committee should consider an open rule allowing anybody to, to offer amendments, either under the ordinary practices of the House, to the bill, or to any of the amendments which are offered, observing the ordinary uh, requirements of the rules of the House. I'd like to tell you a, a story that, that relates to this matter. Uh, at 5 o'clock or thereabouts today, I heard that, that, that there was a possibility that my dear friend, Mr. Norwood, had come to understandings with the White House with regard to this legislation. And we convened at 7.30 a meeting of those of us who were concerned with these matters uh, to discuss what had transpired. At that time, we, we, we talked about uh, the agreement. Uh, I am not able to explain the agreement to this committee, uh, even though Mr. Norwood had the kindness to explain it to me once on the telephone and once in the meeting referred to. I would note that, um, that, that the amendments which he is suggesting offering as a result of an agreement between him and the White House uh, were not subject to any prior consultation with me or with, with my associates. And so I, 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 I have a number of questions which I am not able to, to properly finalize. And when presented to Mr. Norwood, he was not, by reason of events, able to fully explain to me. The amendment is, has neither been reduced to writing in either its substance or in its legislative language. It purports, as I gather, to do, deal with two significant, three significant matters. The first is uh, the way that the uh, findings of the external review panel are handled. Uh, and it would set up a, a rebuttable presumption of validity of the findings of that body. This is, of course, a technical legal matter and requires considerable analysis by skilled legal personnel to understand what this means. Uh, and I'm not able to explain further uh, beyond that point. It also would set up limits as to damages. Uh, these are less technical and can be reduced to fairly simple uh, legislative terms unless, unless somebody wishes to complicate them. The, the last point, however, is that the question of jurisdiction of state courts, validity of state law in cases involving suits of citizens against either employers who have uh, health care plans or uh, against the health care plan themselves uh, are, the, are the subject of the amendment. I detect uh, in my discussions that, that, that this will entail, as Mr. Norbert has indicated, a federal cause of action. 
which I'm not clear whether it will preempt or not preempt state courts. Uh, but in any event, the drafting of a federal cause of action is an enormously technical matter. I gather that, that the drafting of these matters is now going forward, uh, although I, I, cannot, I cannot tell you. I've asked about the, the kind of consultation and opportunity that would be afforded those of us who have been working with, with, with Mr. Norwood, and he's assured that he will, and I believe him, that he will do the best he can to see to it that we see the legislative language at the earliest time. Uh, now, this leaves me then in the awkward position of not knowing when I will see this, of not, of not knowing what the language will say, of not knowing what my position might be on the language or what the House might think after it had a suitable amount of time in which to analyze the language and understand what it means on any of these three principal points. Having said these things, this leaves the House uh, in the rather awkward position of looking at the possibility of this matter being just completed and being rushed to us hot from the copy machine without ever having had a chance to understand. It is possible that Mr. Norwood will find this to be a satisfactory process or that you on this committee will find it to be a satisfactory process. I don't think I would, and I think that the House generally would not find this to be a satisfactory way to proceed about legislation. I would also observe to you that the House will not have a full opportunity to either ask or consider the questions which might be associated with how this legislation either was put together or what it means or all of the subtleties that exist in some very complicated and complex legal questions. This then leaves this committee in the awkward position of being essentially the servant of this body responsible to see to it that the proceedings are fair and that the members have an opportunity to know what it is they are doing, to understand the legislation, how it is going to impact upon them or upon their constituents or upon the economy or upon the people who would be specifically and specially affected by that legislation. I am not satisfied that the time that will be afforded any of us including those who have, who have worked on this legislation for a long period of time, will, under this process, receive a sufficient opportunity either to understand or to ask questions or to amend or to perfect the legislation. If you are determined, however, to put this on the floor tomorrow, and if you are determined to have an amendment not yet drafted, made in order, uh, I think you, order, you, you should afford the rest of us the opportunity uh, to assure that the process is fair, that we have opportunities to, to discuss it fully, to debate it, to understand what all the questions might be, and to offer appropriate amendments. And I believe that that is not only in the interest of the public, but it is in the interest of every single member, including both Mr. Norwood and myself. Uh, and to fail to do that is to almost certainly assure that the legislation which we bring forth from, this com uh, from, from, from the consideration of this legislation uh, will be imperfect and, and hardly able to be trusted by anybody, whether they are HMOs, employers, doctors, or patients, or indeed members of Congress who will be voting upon it. So I would say that, that first, the matter should be postponed until we've had an opportunity to understand and analyze what this what these this amendment is going to do. It is an extremely complex and technical question, and it is an extremely complex and technical piece of legislative drafting. It also is something which has enormous opportunity for great mischief to be done, quite innocently, but done nonetheless. It is also a fine opportunity for rascality and misbehavior. Now, I won't suggest to you that that would occur here, but it is one, nonetheless a fine opportunity for that. Having said these things to you, Mr. Chairman, I, my suggestions are one, the matter should be postponed. Two, we should have an opportunity to know just what in the name of the imperfect and, and hardly able to be trusted by anybody, whether they are HMOs, employers, doctors, or patients, or indeed members of Congress who will be voting upon it. So I would say, that, that first, the matter should be postponed until we've had an opportunity to understand and analyze what, this, what these, this amendment is going to do. It is an extremely complex and technical question.
question, and it is an extremely complex and technical piece of legislative drafting. It also is something which has enormous opportunity for great mischief to be done, quite innocently, but done nonetheless. It is also a fine opportunity for rascality and misbehavior. Now, I won't suggest to you that that would occur here, but it is one, nonetheless a fine opportunity for that. Having said these things to you, Mr. Chairman, I, my suggestions are one, the matter should be postponed. Two, we should have an opportunity to know just what in the name of, of, of common sense we are doing tomorrow. To have an opportunity to understand the amendment, which means that this matter should be postponed at least until after the recess. And I would suggest to you very strongly that if it is to come to the floor, you ought to afford us a su significant amount of time in which the matter may be debated, amended, uh, within the ordinary rules of the House without limit as to time for debate, without limit as to time for amendment, or the number of amendments, or who might offer what amendment to what. Because I am certain that this process absolutely guarantees some extraordinary surprises, which will lead to a number of red faces in this institution, especially those who are, are putting this process together at this time. Having said that, I thank you for your courtesy to me, Mr. Chairman. I hope we thank will be able much, to, to work Dingle. together in a wise and sound legislative fashion. Thank you very much, Mr. Dingle, and uh, I appreciate very much your kind words about the uh, Rules Committee and, and our work here, and I assure you that we are going to proceed in a very fair way, and we want to have a full debate. Uh, I will say that uh, we've been working on this legislation. I know Speaker Hastert has often said that he's been working on this for over a decade. I know that you and many others have. and. We would very much like to ensure that we provide a, a, a patient's bill of rights for the American people, and uh, it's our hope that we'll be able to have this accomplished, at least passage in the House of Representatives before this break, and so we are uh, doing our darndest to do it in the, the fairest and most open way possible. I would suggest, Mr. Chairman, we should hear the Hippocratic Oath, which says, first, do no, do harm. Yes. no harm. We're very familiar with the Hippocratic Oath. You're surrounded by, at least on either side, by uh, Two individuals who've uh, taken that, and I uh, appreciate uh, very much your thoughts. Mr. Gansky. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I think I would start by saying that uh, I'm sure that everyone here misses uh, Mr. Moakley. I've been before this committee a couple times. I used to sit down on the floor with uh, Joe Moakley, and sometimes we would talk about this legislation. And he had a deep interest in this legislation because he felt that HMOs sometimes were not treating patients fairly. We have uh, an amendment uh, before you in the nature of a substitute. Uh, the, the, the difference is that we have some pay force in this amendment. And I would ask that you uh, make our amendment in the nature of a substitute in order. Uh, this has been an interesting uh, day. Um, just uh, a couple hours ago, I had an opportunity to uh, hear Mr. Norwood talk about his conversation with the President and present to us some ideas. Uh, Mr. Norwood has already talked about uh, the main elements of this, uh, basically uh, giving HMOs a rebuttable presumption uh, of evidence, an affirmative defense. I might add, not given to the patients. And there would be some type of a federal standard for a state cause of action. Now, to most people who aren't attorneys, what does that mean? Well, I'm not an attorney, an attorney, but I've sure learned a lot about this because this was an idea that was presented to the by the White House to the authors of this bill, both the uh, House members and the Senate members, about a week ago. And we presented a list of about a page and a half of questions on exactly what that meant, how would you do this. State cause of action is built up over a period of time. This is common law. And yet we are told that at this moment some type of language is being written that would create a federal standard for a state cause of action. Now, people who are much wiser in the law than I say that is a very difficult thing to do. 
I've just returned from the floor, spoke to a lot of my Republican colleagues who are attorneys who have dealt with this, including Lindsey Graham, and they think that this is really a difficult thing to do, much less the right thing to do. Now, when Mr. Norwood talked to us about two hours ago, he said he had cut his deal with the president, but he didn't have anything on paper. In fact, this amendment is being written at this very moment, and we are told that it might be available at 1.30 or 2 o'clock today. Tomorrow. Or tomorrow. Now, I want to remind you of a situation in 1998 when we first debated Patient Bill of Rights, and my Republican colleagues were forced to vote on a bill that was brought to the floor, and they didn't know what was in it, most of them. And boy, were a lot of them embarrassed when it came out afterwards what some of the things were in that bill. Now, we asked Mr. Norwood in this meeting, and there were about 50 people there. We said, Charlie, a fundamental principle of our bill is that HMOs are treated like everyone else. But it looks to us that when you're giving an affirmative defense to HMOs, they're getting an advantage. And here's what Mr. Norwood said, quote, HMOs will be treated better than others, unquote, under our amendment, the amendment that he is proposing. This isn't my language. This is Mr. Norwood's language. Then we said, well, Charlie, where's the language? Do we get a chance to look at this before this very complex issue comes before Congress? We're talking about taking away state law, preempting it. That is not a small matter. Can we look at this language? I don't have any language. And here's what Mr. Norwood said. We said, well, do you think that's right? And here's what Mr. Norwood said in his own words. Mr. Norwood said, quote, Mr. Norwood doesn't, quote, think that it is fair to be presented with such a complex idea and have only a few minutes to look at it before voting, unquote. And yet, if this bill comes before the House tomorrow, that's exactly what you're asking members to do. On not a small matter, it's a simple thing to present a, an amendment that has a $1.5 million cap. It is not a simple thing for members to understand the implications of writing a state standard for or a federal standard for a state cause of action. In our opinion, from what we've heard, this would take away patient protection legislation that has recently passed in states like New Jersey and Texas, and, Texas, and probably Georgia as well. So I'm going to concur with my colleague, Mr. Dingell. If this does come to the floor tomorrow, this should be an open rule. But I would encourage it not to come to the floor tomorrow. I have fought a long time to try to get this to the floor. But to bring this type of amendment to the floor, unexamined, written in the middle of the night, and ask our colleagues to vote for a pig and a poke is not fair. Furthermore, there are real implications as to whether, if that amendment would pass, patient Bill of Rights would have a, a chance in conference. So this is about more than an amendment. I think, Mr. Chairman, it's only fair that at this late time at night, when nobody has seen the language for the crucial amendment on the debate for this coming bill, that we postpone this vote until after the August recess. That's thank you. Very much. Thank you. Mr. Berry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll associate myself with the remarks that have been made by Dr. Gansky and Mr. Dingell. And I think it is absolutely ridiculous that we would even think about putting this bill on the floor tomorrow and asking the members of this House to vote for it. Nobody knows what's in it. Even the people that think they agreed to an agreement don't know what's in it, don't know for sure what they want in it. 
And we must remember that what this is all about is real people getting the health care that they need. And if they don't get it, they're going to suffer serious consequences, many of them for the rest of their lives, if not lose their lives as a consequence of these actions. And we're changing the law in a way that makes the insurance companies less accountable than they are today in many ways. And I think each one of us, and certainly this committee, should be encouraged to look at it in that way. And for us to take this up tomorrow, we need at least until after the recess to look at this bill and consider all the things that it does. It will just effectively make sure that a patient's bill of rights, once again, does not get passed in this session of Congress. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Berry, and thanks to uh, all of you for your thoughts. You've all been pretty clear as to where you stand on the issue and what it is you'd like th this uh, committee to do. Um, I'd, I'd like to, uh, in light of the, uh, the statements that were made by uh, three members of the panel, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Norwood if he would comment at all on uh, some of the uh, issues that have been raised of, of concern from uh, some of your colleagues about the meetings that uh, had been held and, and uh, your view. Dr. Gansky quoted me correctly. Uh, it is a very difficult thing for me to have any opportunity to ask any of these men to consider the changes that are going to be needed to get a signature in such a short period of time. I mean, I, there's no way I can defend or argue against that because, you know, I'm a little bit like they are. We have agreed to a set of circumstances for which there is no final agreement until we see language, which I'm as anxious, uh, you know, as the rest of them here to see it, and I'm anxious like the rest of them to be sure that it is correct because whatever our differences are about whether we go tomorrow or Friday or, or September, our differences, the four of us don't have any differences in our concern uh, for the patients and to be sure that what we do finally have as a product does exactly what I stated earlier. And there, Mr. Dingle is correct. It is a very difficult piece of legislation to write. Uh, I have no capacity to write legislation like that, so I'm dependent on, on ledge counsel and others. And at some time during the morning, I've got to do like everybody else. I've got to get hold of it and see if, in fact, what we said we wanted to do is being done and the consequences of that in this legislation. So. I have no defense to their complaints, and they know it. And it would be silly for me to say that uh, it's, it's a pretty tough situation. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Goss. Thank you. Dr. Dorn, I wanted to ask you, uh, I think you've explained your um, situation very carefully on what the new provisions are. I think there's a lot of interest on um, the liability question uh, and the concern about a disincentive to employers to offer health care insurance, whether it's affordable or not is another issue, but the question of offering health care insurance is a critical question given the number of people who do not have health care insurance in this country. Do you think that the arrangements that you worked out with the Speaker and the President today do provide the kind of response uh, that employers have been looking for about limiting liability as long as there is other legitimate recourse for patients who have been injured to go to? Well, I, you know, I, I have always, in my entire career, have always believed that there had to be limits on liability. It is totally unfair, I believe, to put people in a situation there where their profession or their business or their wealth or their family is at risk because there's an unknown amount of liability that no one can protect themselves from. Uh, I had fought very hard for a number of years with most of you in this room about not putting limits on liability in the Norwood Dingle Bill, uh, although I feel strongly they should be there. But I did that because I was interested in making sure that we got that presidential signature. Now, President Clinton was a president who would have vetoed our bill had it had limits on liability, as we call caps. But the reality of life is that President Bush 
is a president that is going to veto our bill if we don't put reasonable limits on caps. So not only did it, it works with my personal beliefs, but it, my goal here is to get out of a conference and get a signature. And there are a number of ways for that not to happen. One of the ways is, and Greg's right, I'm sure because of this we'll have a very interesting conference, but I believe that we have an opportunity to get it out and get it signed. So, you know, either side, either party could kill these bills in conference. We've seen, all of us have seen that happen, or the president has a chance to veto it. And I'm trying to find and thread that needle so that we can do what we tried to start to do six years ago and actually change the laws of this country that have been so one-sided on behalf of the insurance industry. And I think this, I hope this is going to be a mechanism where we finally uh, can change the law and have the president sign it. Thank you. That was mostly responsive to my question, but not entirely. And I certainly would commend you and everybody else at the table and others in the room for a lot of years of hard work on this subject. Uh, the, the question, let me restate it another way. The paper we have in front of us says, under designated decision maker, employers will be allowed to designate a decision maker who will have sole liability for benefit determinations. Is that an accurate reflection of what your amendment I, I looked to say? at that and I didn't write that paper and, and I think I had some questions about what somebody else wrote. Uh, All right, it's the paper I've got in front of me that purports to uh, be well, the it's agreement. the one I think that was perhaps put out by the White House. White House Communications Office is that. The if you'll hold that, uh, this is this is the uh, <clears throat> this is the uh, copy of the agreement that it, uh, I'd be happy to share. With you well, that'd be nice. Who wrote that yeah, copy? We well, uh, this is uh, one that was provided us. Vince, the, the White House, the White House uh, provided this uh, outline of the agreement. The designated decision maker model that has been uh, that was produced over in the Senate with the sole purpose of trying to protect employers uh, is a model that was taken up uh, in our bill. There's been some discussion, I believe, over a, a period of time as to exactly how that particular model worked. For example, you see the same model in the Fletcher bill as opposed to the Gansky-Dingle bill. And the, the correct model is the one in the Gansky Dingle bill, and the president has uh, has agreed to accept that language. So we have worked out uh, the problem of designated decision maker, and that's a fine and good way to do it. Uh, you may know over the years we continually tried uh, the Norwood Dingle bill tried to protect the employer. Uh, and we then used the, the model that the employment community wanted us to use, which was direct participation. I think in 99, the opposing bill, nothing would do unless we used that, and we moved to that model. Then that model wasn't good enough, and we finally agreed upon and settled upon the designated decision-maker model where the employer can have, it ought to really be designated person who's liable, but. Uh, the employer can have and appoint someone, but must have someone uh, who, who can accept responsibility for the liability and has deep enough pockets to handle it. Have I answered your question? Is another way to ask, to answer the question to say that the employer who has designated a decision maker has no liability? Yes. Thank you. That's where we're trying to get. That's what I thought. Could I, could I, could I make a couple of comments? Sure. And I say this with respect and affection for my friend, Mr. Norwood. First of all, uh, we have had this in for some while. It is in the proposal that we are on which we are asking a rule, which is the bill which was most recently introduced by all of us here. Uh, and, and so the, the decision maker is in that legislation. I would observe that beyond that, no one can do anything other than to speculate as to what will be in the proposal which has been characterized in the document which you have held up to us. Simple fact of the matter is that is, is not yet drafted, so we don't know what's in it. We all hope, but none of us know. And so we all then speculate. I thank you. 
Well, I'd be happy to provide you a copy of this document because I, we I, do know I, what's in this one. I have, I have seen it, and I have participated in the speculation with everybody else who has seen it. Thank you very much, Mr. Dingell. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. you very much, Mr. Frost. Uh, Mr. Norwood, is it possible that once you see the actual legislative language that's been drafted, that you may not be able to agree to that language, that, that you may have uh, want to do something different? Yeah, the President reserves that right, too. Well, what do we do then? What happens if uh, 2 o'clock this morning we get a copy of the legislative language, you get a copy of the legislative language, uh, we're asked to make that in order. Do we, do we bring you back in at 2 a.m. and ask if you've had a chance to read it? Do we wait till tomorrow morning and bring you in and say, is this what you wanted to do? What, what kind of guidance can you give the committee on how we should call proceed? Me in the morning, Mr. Frost. I, I don't think I'll be here at 2 a.m., but... Well, we may be. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah. Don't call me, please. We, uh, we have to... All of, I stated that early on. The agreement is on a set of principles that if we can accomplish those principles in legislative language, then we can move forward. But everybody has to look at that language including the President of the United States. Well, I, I, I'm asking a practical question, uh, Mr. Norwood, is what does this committee do uh, when, when we get this language? Do we just uh, recess and say we'll come back later the next day after everybody's had a chance to read it uh, before we, uh, we, we move forward? Do we go ahead and adopt a rule and make it in order knowing that you may have to repudiate the language on the floor? I, I, I'm puzzled as to how this committee should proceed. I know you're looking at me, but I'm certain you're directing that question to your chairman. Well, I, uh, <laughs> well how, would you, how would you want us to proceed? Let That's me just say that I think Mr. Frost probably in most instances prefers to look at you than he does at the chairman. But uh, let, let me uh, just comment that uh, we obviously are, are working uh, with a, uh, a challenging circumstance. We all acknowledge that. And I will tell you that this is not unprecedented. Uh, we have dealt with... Uh, time limits before and different constraints. Mr. Dingell obviously has uh, been here longer than any of the rest of us and has certainly uh, encountered uh, situations like this. We are... Okay, well... of speculation. I've never encountered yes. a situation like this in the 23 years that I've been on the committee where the author of the amendment says, gee, I don't know, I'll have to let you, le let you know later when I see the language. Well, it's exciting that the Rules Committee and the legislative process is charting into uh, new waters. Uh, say, and uh, we are hoping very much that we can bring about uh, an agreement. Uh, Mr. Norwood and the President of the United States and the Speaker of the House of Representatives were involved in this, and uh, we are going to, I, I will say to members of the committee that we want this process to proceed, and uh, just as soon as we finish with this panel, I know that Mr. Norwood will be able to uh, work with those who are putting together the final uh, language on this, and, uh, and then we'll be able to get it back, and this committee will uh, clearly uh, work its will, and we'll make a determination as to uh, where we proceed from there. Well, let me ask Mr. Norwood a very specific question, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Norwood, is it your request to this committee that you want us to wait to act on granting a rule until you've had a chance to fully review the draft and let us know that the draft is what you want to do? I think you can go ahead and grant the rule, Mr. Frost, and if we don't get there, then at 2 o'clock in this morning, I can always come back and say there's not agreement. But if we've, if we've granted a rule and then you repudiate the agreement, what happens? Where does that leave us? I, have, I, I, pres I hope you'll, we, we can withdraw. Let's withdraw the rule at that point? Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm, I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm just trying no, to understand I, where we are. I understand. I think that I think that what uh, Mr. Norwood has uh, just indicated is certainly uh, what we would take into consideration. We know that we have gotten to this point because of the fact that Mr. Norwood, working in concert with the President and the Speaker, uh, have come to an agreement. And uh, obviously, if there is uh, not an agreement, we I think would be hard pressed to uh, proceed. Mr. Chairman, and, I would observe that I have not heard of an agreement between Mr. Norwood and the President or the Speaker. I've heard that they're hoping for, for an agreement, but I've not heard that such agreement I think Mr. Norwood has talked about uh, an agreement that uh, he is 
brought forward, and we again have had the outline on this, and I know that they're working on the legislative language and, on that. And Mr. Mr. Chairman, you, indica Trust. you indicated earlier in the testimony before these witnesses came in that the Rules Committee would not act until we had the language ourselves, and I assume that is still the case. Legislative language. That we would not, we would not That's grant a rule until we had the legislative language and had ample time to review that language. I, I will, I will tell you that uh, clearly we are, we would not be reporting out a rule uh, without the language and uh, without, as Mr. Hastings correctly just uh, interjected, the uh, ample amount of time for the minority to uh, see that. I, Mr. Mr. Norwood, the, the, I would only mention something that happened to me many years ago. Um, I was when I, one of my first terms on the committee. Um, I was actually the author of a particular provision that was negotiated uh, by several people, and I won't mention the particular committee staff. It was not Mr. Dingle's staff. I'm, it was a, sure, it was not. It was a the particular committee staff was charged with drafting the language to implement the agreement that I and some others had uh, negotiated. And lo and behold, when that language came back, it was not what we had agreed to. In fact, it was exactly the opposite of what we had agreed to. Um, and this was this presented a very interesting situation. Uh, Mr. Sessions. Mr. Chairman. Uh, it seems like we're struggling. And yet I think that we really there's really no need to do that. I think Dr. Norwood has showed up. Uh, showed his enormous uh, ability to present himself with the gentleman who before today, even today, had been his co-sponsors. He has informed us, and it's no surprise to millions of people around America, that he has now cut a deal, that he's openly been working with the President of the United States and the Speaker on for quite some time, and that he has come forth with them but is not prepared with his bill, mm -hmm. and that we should not question him about his, uh, about his bill that he should have an opportunity to have leg legislative counsel prepare that, have people uh, a chance to look at it, that this committee, I hope, does not grant a rule until we've had a chance to look at it and see that and have Dr. Norwood come and do that. But I would think that the reasonable thing to do would be to thank Dr. Norwood, pat him on the back for coming here, and let us proceed with all these other people who are here Chairman, with I their amendments. Mr. Mr. Well, let me just say that uh, Mr. Frost has the uh, the time, and thank you very much for that uh, recommendation, Mr. Uh, Sessions. And I, we certainly do want Mr. Norwood to have the chance to get to work in the not too distant future. Mr. Frost, uh, Mr. Norwood, I have a specific question regarding the uh, the one page summary. Now, I know that you didn't necessarily prepare the one page summary, but it purports to be an agreement that you reached with the President and the Speaker. Um, and this is under the second paragraph. Yes. It's under the second paragraph, liability provisions, cause of action. Second paragraph on the page. Patients will be guaranteed new federal remedies to hold their health plans accountable when they have been injured by a wrongful denial or delay of medical care. Now, my question is, what happens when there's been malpractice? What happens when it's not denial of care, it's not delay of care, it's simply that the, uh, the uh, health maintenance organization's employees made a terrible mistake in performing the care. Right. What, 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 what happens in those instances? Actually, sometimes there may be cases where harm has occurred and it isn't a denial that has Not occurred. a denial and not delay. And, and all of this falls, the denial part is under the federal right. definition. The, and what I said earlier tonight was that part of this agreement that is very, very, very important is that we make sure we don't create, preempt other causes of action at the state level. And we would intend for those to be taken up at the state level. Well, there is a, uh, there is a problem, and Mr. Dingle may want to comment on this. Under current ERISA law, um, in, you can't sue in many states. Uh, because there is a preemption. You can't sue for malpractice. You can't sue a, uh, uh, an HMO for malpractice. And I'm not sure what your intention is here. Uh, there's the whole question of, the, uh, of ERISA and the way it uh, preempts state law. Uh, maybe Mr. Dingle could comment on that, or perhaps you could. Well, the intent here is to not use this as the only remedy. I mean, I'm pretty clear that a, a denial leads to a lot of openings and we, we don't want that to occur. 
How, and there are other areas in which you can sue at state law, malpractice, negligence, and John can tell you the others. Uh, and that would be our intent where their remedy would come occur, would be at the state level. And I want to make sure that we maintain that. It's your intent that there would be any limitations on recovery in those state actions? Yes, there would be limitations on those, but it would be determined by the state, for which I think 38 states do have limitations of varied kinds and degrees. Uh, Mr. Dangle, can you comment on this particular issue? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm driven to speculation, as indeed we all are, because we don't have the language of it before us. I would note for you, first of all, if you, if you look, insurers are going to have their, their cases heard in state court. They will be subject to the new federal law. The question you have to ask is, is, is what becomes then a state law? Are they going to throw out, for example, uh, the law in California or the law in, in Georgia or the law in Florida or uh, in, any of the, in Texas or any of the other states? And is that going to is that going to entail the throwing out of, of limitations in, in the state uh, with regard to damages which will be afforded? Uh, the you you are running into also a very peculiar situation where state courts are now going to be construing federal law. Are they going is is this going to require then an appeal to a federal court of appeals or the U.S. Supreme Court? And and the question you might ask is. Uh, you're going to have here then the insurer tried in, in have his business tried in state court, but the lawsuit is going to entail a suit against first of all the, the HMO. It is also going to entail a suit against the doctor. The doctor is going to have his suit tried under state law. Now the question then is how is is the doctor going to be treated the same way as the, as the uh, as the HMO. It's unlikely because uh, Mr. Norwood has already indicated, and these papers indicate, that, that he will be treated, that, that the HMO will be treated differently. So the doctor then goes to, goes to court being sued uh, over uh, a failure of an HMO to afford treatment, a proper treatment under the contract to the uh, patient. Uh, the, under, under joint and several liability, the doctor gets stuck with 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 a judgment. The HMO gets off. The HMO, because the, the liability is joint and several, winds up uh, with with a judgment which the jury assesses against them of let's say a couple of three million dollars. The doctor, without fault, because he's been sued, can wind up with liability for the wrongdoing of the HMO without undergoing without having ever done anything wrong. You have here a situation which is rather dangerous from the standpoint of everybody and which leads to some rather extraordinary events and results uh, which I cannot sensibly predict to you at this time. Dr. Gansky, do you have any comments on this? Well, I, it's hard to make a comment uh, when you don't, have, uh, you don't have the legislative language. And uh, that is the, uh, the problem that we're dealing with uh, right now. Uh, this is it, is, it is not easy to figure out exactly what an amendment tries to do. You have some other amendments before you tonight. <laughs> um, the difference of a word or two or a double negative in the language can mean the whole opposite effect. And uh, that is... That is why, if you're talking about something that is as complex as uh, a federal standard for a state cause of action, uh, this is something that really needs to be out there uh, and, and vetted and discussed. We've had our bill out there for a, a long time. The, uh, the pay-fors in this are not new. They've been talked about before as well. And. Um, I think just as a matter of uh, fairness, uh, the conversations that have gone on, especially with Mr. Norwood, uh, saying that, he, you know, if the, if, if the language that eventually evolves sometime early in the morning uh, isn't to his uh, uh, liking, then he would be in the position of, uh, of arguing against his own amendment if you make it in order. 
I think that's a remarkable uh, thing. I don't think that you should put somebody in the, into that position. And um, this, is, this, is, this will be even more difficult to figure out than some of the amendments that you're dealing with. I think this just argues for, at this point in time, uh, putting this back uh, into September. Well, let me just say that we certainly don't intend to uh, put Mr. Norwood in a position where he would be arguing against his own amendment. That's not the intent of the committee. Are you completed, Mr. Frost? Any further questions? Well, I really don't have uh, I have a comment, uh, Mr. Chairman. Certainly, I don't uh, don't have uh, further questions. I, I just think that uh, Dr. Gansky is exactly correct, uh, Mr. Dingell and others, that this is something that is uh, still a moving target, and um, I don't know why we should fe feel compelled to rush this to the floor tomorrow. Now we could stay here till Friday, I guess. Uh, I mean, I. I assumed I took the Republican leadership at its word when it said that we were going to be here until Friday originally, and I didn't make any travel plans. Uh, uh, I'm still going to be around on Friday. I can't speak for all my colleagues. And certainly at the very minimum, there ought to be enough time for the author of the amendment to review his own amendment yeah, and, then, and, then, and then be able to advise the committee. And I, I don't know why we have that's to take this up uh, uh, on, a, on a hurry-up basis tomorrow. And it may be that we, that Mr. Gant, Dr. Gansky is right, and that we should do this in September after everyone's had a chance to review the language. Uh, um, this is not a budgetary matter. This is not an appropriation bill where the government's going to shut down if we don't vote on it in the next uh, in the next few hours. Um, this is we're going to be in session during the entire month of September, and my guess is uh, October, perhaps even November. Um, I think we'll have ample time to. Uh, to deal with this issue. We appreciate your recommendation. Mr. Linder. Chairman, uh, gentlemen, this is an interesting point we're at. In 1992, when I ran an election to bring me here, the entire thrust of public policy would, or, was to urge more people into managed care. And HMOs are just a facet of managed care. Upon the Jackson Hole summit with academicians and bureaucrats determining that the health care system was mostly chaos, that bureaucrats and managers could better manage it. Charlie, you came here two years later and began making the case that it wasn't treating patients fairly and began a crusade that in the last seven years has changed the entire public perception of this issue. I've known you for 25 years and you're the most hard-headed, I won't say SO, yeah, my hard-headed fellow I've known. And I've disagreed with you through much of this. But I'm proud of the effort you put forth. And I do believe you're on the edge of getting something signed by a president of the United States that will actually bring some protections to patients. And that's really what it's about. And so I hope it goes forward. I'm confident your language will be worked out. I'm confident we can be here voting. It may be Friday. I'm not worried about that. But um, you should be proud, because I'm proud of what you've done. Hall. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just, uh, I think all of us agree that this is probably our number one issue this year and has been for some time. I think all of us, when we have our town hall meetings, at least in Ohio, when I have them, my number one issue is always health care. And uh, it takes the overwhelmingly number of questions and people that come in with a problem. So. And that's turned into this patient bill of rights, of which we've been debating for 10 years now. This is the first time I think I've seen in front of the Rules Committee where the four principal sponsors of the bill uh, are kind of really at a disadvantage in asking us to pass a rule of which three of the four have not seen, and the fourth is not quite sure what the language is going to look like. I think Mr. Sessions had a good point. I think Mr. Frost has spoken to it. I think all of you have spoken to it. There's no reason, if this is our number one issue, probably of the decade, that we shouldn't put this off for a couple of weeks until we know exactly what we're doing so that the consumers of this country can benefit by having a good bill that protects them. And uh, so I, I hope that we wouldn't pass a rule 
that we would wait uh, a few weeks until all of us have had a chance to take a look at it. And so we can, at least we know what the target is and we know what we're trying to do and agree on the principles. We, we, most of us do agree on the principles, but we just uh, lately, in the last 24 hours, we don't even know what it looks like now because it's all changed. So I think, you know, the country, we owe it to the country to do our best and we're not doing our best right now. I think we should wait. Thank you, Mr. diaz Bellart. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, would like to add my voice to uh, Mr. Linder, and uh, I want to commend all of you. I mean, you all worked very hard uh, for many years on this issue uh, and deserve uh, to be commended. Mr. Norwood, uh, what you have done uh, by persevering and holding firm to your principles, uh, We've seen not only in multiple public occasions, but in private conversations, how you have made so clear that you were going to hold firm and get patients' rights. Um, and as Mr. Linder said, to see that we're on the threshold of that actually becoming a reality is something that uh, makes us all very proud. And you have made us very, very proud. Um, I have a question. There seems to be a direct contradiction, <coughs> at least I heard and I may have misunderstood, with regard to the understanding uh, on, on the agreement with regard to the preemption issue. Mr. Norwood, you said that you and the President had both been very clear and wanted to make certain that any state rights any rights that have been given patients by state legislatures are not preempted. And I thought that I'd heard Mr. Gansky say the opposite, that, that his estimation or his understanding of what this agreement could uh, be or was, uh, was otherwise. And so uh, can, can you uh, reflect again or, or clarify uh, that point again? Parts to that. Uh, one is within the patient protection standards which there is agreement on with everybody, including the White House, those standards that we have been fighting for that would be, uh, and they're basic, frankly, basic standards in health care insurance plans, would affect the states, but it is a floor, not a ceiling. The states can further pass other patient protections in their individual states and put them into, into effect. Uh, the other part of this that I'm very concerned about, and I know everybody at this table is very concerned about, is that are we able to write this language in such a way so that we have a federal cause of action available in federal court and state court, and at the same time make sure that uh, other types of causes of actions in the states are not preempted. And all I can tell you, because I don't have language yet in front of me, but all I can tell you is that my intent, and I know that President Bush's intent, is that we do not preempt those other causes of action. And it's, it's pretty important. Thank you very much. Mr. Slaughter. of federal law and of interpretation, but where the federal government acts in an area in which it may act, if its action is in any way inconsistent with state law operating in the same area, that the state law may be preempted and indeed probably will be and will certainly be so if there is, if the two are inconsistent. So I would, I would say this is a technical question upon which none of us have any answers. All of us are, are forced to speculate until such time as the, as the legislative language is before us. And even then, when we have made our own judgments, we may find the courts will find that there is preemption. Slaughter. On that point a little bit, if I may, Mr. Norwood, as I understand it, what you're saying is that the HMOs will be in, under the new federal law, 
uh, the employer may go to the federal court if he chooses, he or she chooses. But any case against doctors will be in state court. Is that correct? That is how it is now. The, everything that I've read indicated that this new federal law, no matter, even if you were in state court, you would be under the jurisdiction of that law. Is that not true? Let, 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 let me, Ms. Slaughter, let me try to say how I think it is. The new federal definition for this cause of action will automatically take employers who are self-insured and self-administered into federal court. Mm -hmm. They will deal with federal guidelines. Other employers yeah. who are fully insured, et cetera, and HMOs will go into state court. Under, under the federal under the federal cause of action and the limitations and protections thereof, which is there, whether you agree with that or not, there's some good reasons to do that. I don't buy into all this story that all this is going to cost so much and everybody's going to drop insurance and all that. That's that's nonsense. But it does, in fact, give people who are furnishing the insurance and running businesses some standards that they all can follow, which is the big value of this. Now, the bottom, the, the result, if the result is the cause of doing that, that we preempt other causes of actions in the states, we've got another set of problems, and that, that's a different story. That is not my intent, it's not the President's intent, but Mr. Ding was right. Who knows until you see and try to understand the language completely. Well, let me speak to that in a moment. Uh, are you a designated person that you can speak for the President of the United States and the Speaker if you see the language? Well, the deal was both all parties got to see it, then see if we still have an agreement. And so I, you're, what you're saying is you think I'm it's only impossible to put to this bill on the floor? If, if I believe it is working. But I can assure you. You only speak for yourself. The White House can also say, we don't think this is workable back to the draw, draw, drawing board, and so can I. And I'm not going, I do not wish to bring this amendment until we have it as right as we humanly possibly can. Then you're asking that it be postponed. No, I didn't say that. It certainly seems to me beyond the realm of human possibility that we'll have the White House, the Speaker, and you all looking at this, and it hasn't even been written yet, and we will be on the floor tomorrow at 9 o'clock with it. I sure hope it's not 9 o'clock whenever it is. <laughs> That's what, what we're used to. But let, let me say something else, too. You've mentioned a couple of times that, that what your intent here is to get something that will be signed, that you want a signature. That, that, well, that yes, that's pretty important. If we're going to change the law, we've been down the road of just passing bills. But it also, uh, it also has to meet in my mind, with the criteria that I believe all of us want to see in a patient protections bill. Have you included the Senate in that? I'm sorry? Have you included the Senate in that calculation? I understand the problems that the Senate is going to have with these changes. I understand that's what a conference is for. I understand that a conference can be killed by either group, the House or the Senate. That possibility was raging as a great one. We just went through that two years ago. This is my best bet at how we well, can get in there, work this out, and get it signed. The rumor among colleagues here is that the intent here is to kill the bill, uh, that this is something that you understand before going in there, that the Senate is not going to take, and that that's the end of it. Ms. Slaughter, there are people on both sides of the aisle and there are people involved at every level that want to kill this bill. <coughs> We've been fighting that as are hard. Are you one of them, Mr. Norwood? We've been fighting that as hard as we can. But I want you to know that the President of the United States doesn't want to kill this bill. The Speaker of the House I thought he finish. did. He, he recommended a veto up on Dr. Fletcher's bill. I mean, unless yeah. he got that one. He but recommended then, a veto of our bill. And he vetoed your bill and like Dr. Fletcher's and then almost overnight, we switched liability around, and, and you're, you're, you're the man. Now, it's your bill. I'm going to answer that question for the record. I don't want to kill any bill. My objective is to get it into law. But I'm telling you, Ms. Slaughter, so is it the President's and so is it the Speaker's, but the President is saying 
I'm going to sign a bill, but I'm going to have some input into it. Well, Tom Dash will send us a good bill over here. They worked hard on a good, strong bill, and I believe he has every intent that we would send something back equally as, as good as I, that. I'm not, I'm not unhappy with the bill that came over here. I worked on it mighty hard. had a lot to do with mm -hmm. it, including the amendment. And if it were just me, I'd be very pleased. But it isn't just me. It doesn't satisfy the person who gets to sign it. He wants some things changed. Now, I have never ignored President Clinton in terms of his signature on bills we've tried to do. I have always considered we've got to eventually get to where the president will sign it. That's where I am today. I'm giving this president the same courtesies. He's got some problems, and we can't ignore that because if we ignore that at our peril. Not that I think he would ever get a veto because I think perhaps if had we sent them straight up our bill in the into the conference with some amendment which would have passed, it would have died the same way that the Norwood Dingle bill did. Is it possible that happens now with these changes? I hope not. We got to see how these changes are going to work. I mean, you know what I'd like more than anything in the world? I'd like for us to be able to make this, these changes and my friend John Dingle be okay with it. That's important to me. Well, let's see. Maybe he can't. I mean, I know Mr. Dingle well enough to know he probably can't by tomorrow no matter what's in it. I don't think anybody's going right. to be able to do I, that, I Mr. Norwood. I, I, I was hoping you'd say that but the last you'd like to give this a good, fair chance and give us all an opportunity to really understand this bill before and that you recommend we postpone it. I've never been asked by anybody if I wanted to decide when a bill was coming up, and I'm not being asked now. And I'm, I'm satisfied with what you said, that you don't know any way on God's earth that you're going to be able to read this bill, the President of the United States is going to be able to read it, and the Speaker of the House is going to be able to read it, and it's going to be on the floor in the morning. Well, That's accurate. Me, I, I will. I didn't say that. Didn't say that I, I, he said he was not no. designated to speak for them, Mr. Lender. And and so, and do but that all three of them had to do it. <laughs> I, I, I don't have the record, but I think you mentioned that you thought it was pretty difficult to get that done by in the morning. I have not. Don't you think it's difficult? Everybody knows. I it's think difficult. it's impossible. It's been very difficult, Mr. Slaughter. We're all trying to move ahead because I think Mr. Norwood has very appropriately said that he wants to get a bill to the President of the United States that will help ensure a Bill of Rights for the patients in this country who desperately need it. And I, I'm, I think that we have a chance to do that. And we're trying to move this along. And we want very much to have Mr. Norwood get back to work. And I'm hoping that when this panel is completed, that we'll be able to let Mr. Norwood get back to work. And I'm not, I'm not going to cut off anybody from asking Mr. Norwood or other members of the panel questions. Please feel free well, to continue to ask questions if you wish. Mrs. Slaughter. Just, just let me say that we've all wanted that. I, I've waited a long time. I've been a co-sponsor of all these bills. I've been waiting a long time. I'm willing to wait a little bit longer uh, to make sure we get it right. And I think that that's what we're doing. Any more questions? No, any more questions. Thank you very much. Mr. Hastings. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think you correctly said that this problem really, from the standpoint of being the Rules Committee, is a process problem. Let me, let me review how I view this uh, from a process standpoint. First of all, it's been said a number of times that this issue has been around for a long time. Uh, I think everybody would, would agree with that. I think everybody would agree that this issue, in addition to this issue having been around for a long time, the one issue that is a sticking point is a liability issue. If I've, I've talked to my friend Charlie a number of times that uh, 92 to 95 percent is uh, pretty well agreed on, but this is the tough part. There's absolutely no question about that. Part of the process that goes with that is that we are faced, once again, as we are faced with many times in this process, another deadline. The deadline is the August break. Uh, that is a fact. But probably most important about all of this, and to me it's a, it's, it's a, it's a point that I want, to, want you all to consider, not taking any away from my friend from Arkansas as being part of the three, but the, but the three of you have been involved in this. This, this, has, been, this has been called Norwood, Dingle, Gansky. It's been called Gansky, Dingle, Norwood. It's been called uh, Dingle, Norwood, Gansky. I guess it's from whatever perspective it is, but you three have been involved uh, in this uh, more than uh, anybody else, and you're identified with this issue. 
and you've been working together. And I know that you've been talking a lot together. You see, see each other on the floor uh, in that regard. But where we are now in the process is that there is an agreement. But the agreement is only with one of you three. All three of you, I suspect, had the same opportunity to go down and meet with the president and try to find common ground. As a matter of fact, we did not. Well, you could have had. I mean, I, I, maybe there's an agreement that uh, all three of you had. But, what, but, but here, here's the challenge, I think, that we are faced, because you're, you are, are involved in dealing with the substance of the bill that the whole House and, indeed, the Congress has, has to work with, because you're identified with this. We are charged with how do we move this process along. Charlie has come up with, a, uh, with, with agreement with the president. It could very easily, uh, Greg, have been you. Now, if you had come up here, for example, Greg or John, if you had come up here and the other two were, were contrary to that, you probably would be in exactly the same position as Charlie. We have a broad outline and we're asking you to move the process forward. Our decision, it seems to me, uh, is to try to respect that uh, the process is very difficult. Uh, Charlie, you have said over and over that you want to see what the language is. This agreement is is based on whatever that language is of which you can agree on and the president can, can agree on, and hopefully Mr. Gansky and Dingle. I mean, that's that's obviously the challenge. So I guess the, the also part of the process is the realization, and I think this is the realization, Charlie, that you came up with, is that the president has to be a player in this because he threatened to veto the bill that you all three had worked so hard on. That is a fact. And finally, the last thing I'd like to say, and this is the genius, once again, of our founding fathers, they didn't build a unicameral legislature, or Congress. They built a bicameral. The Senate has already acted on this, and now the Congress, the, the House is acting on it this year. It'll go to conference. Is this the final product? Who knows? Uh, obviously, uh, I would guess that uh, Charlie and the President would hope that whatever agreement they have, if they could plug in, that would be the final conference, and the other body would say, hooray, we finally got it done, but that is probably unlikely. So the challenge that's facing us, it seems, to, uh, is how do we get this, how do we continue moving this process along? And Mr. I think, uh, and, and yeah, I'll let you respond, Greg. And I think uh, Mr. Linder uh, is exactly right. Uh, uh, we, we finally have an opportunity to have at least the closure on a patient's bill of rights. To me, that is, uh, that is very, very significant. And uh, one thing that I've learned in the time that I've served in this body and other legislative bodies is that deadlines force you to reach a decision. We are at that point right now in this half of the Congress. And so I hope that, uh, I hope that the uh, language would be acceptable to what uh, your broad agreement is, uh, Charlie, and I would certainly hope that uh, John, you and Greg would, uh, and Marion, you'd go along with that. Uh, that remains to be seen, obviously. You'll, you'll have to look at it. But it's a process problem, and I, I just want to say that we are challenged. We are, we are faced here uh, meeting tonight. By the way, I might, I might say that this is rather early for us to meet, so we, we, uh, we have some time yet. Uh, maybe, maybe we don't want to, but we do have some time. So I, uh, I, if I you have any comment on that, Greg, we weren't up to hear what you have to say. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to respond to that a little bit. Um, the uh, principal authors of the, uh, of the, of the uh, bill, both on the House side and the Senate side, made a good faith offer to the President a few days ago. A series of them. A series of them, uh, but on a very significant issue that had to do with the uh, self-insured, self-administered. Something that the President had wanted in terms of uniformity and also in terms of employer protection. We've heard from a lot of those self-insured, self-administered, saying that was all right. That was a good faith uh, effort. But the fact of the matter is, you've heard from my colleague from Georgia that he doesn't know whether there's a deal or not because he hasn't seen the language. And he's told you tonight on several occasions that, you know, when that language comes along, I may not agree to it. So there's no deal until you agree to the language. And my good friend from, from Georgia admitted that I, I uh, uh, quoted him correctly when earlier this evening he said, I don't think that it is fair for a member to be presented with such a complex idea and only have a few minutes to look at it and then have to vote. All of that argues, I think, at this point in time, Take a step back, 
This is to look at it, whatever the language is, to allow the people <coughs> so that we're not asking our colleagues tomorrow. I tell you what, there are going to be a number of Republicans that are watching this hearing right now that are tomorrow on the floor, they, they will not vote for this amendment. Well, because, I, because they haven't had an adequate chance to understand what it means. And I believe that it is your duty and responsibility of members of the rule committee to treat members of the House fairly. And that means that we have an opportunity to look at a complex proposal. And one that comes in at 2 in the morning of this nature doesn't meet that bill. Well, I, I would just, uh, and I, I appreciate your input on this, but uh, obviously no deal is ever done on any piece of legislation until you read that legislation and are agreeable. And, I, and, and so uh, that, that is no different uh, from, from my perception. That's no difference in any other difficult piece of legislation that we're going to work with. But Mr. Hastings, it's, it's a process. Mr. Hastings, we'll, how we'll many, have an opportunity to look at it. How many times <coughs> has somebody come to you on this rules committee and argued for an amendment where they don't have the language. Well, they don't know Greg, what it does. Greg, we've, we've always had the language. You heard the chairman say, and, and, and that has been something that, uh, obviously, before I got here, it's always been there. I'll yield to the Absolutely. Chairman. Well, let me, let me just say that, again, as I said to Mr. Frost at the outset, when this issue came up, Mr. Hastings raised the concern about this, that the Rules Committee will report this out when we have the language. And we anxiously look forward to that. And I will say again that we look forward to providing Mr. Norwood with the opportunity to get back to work. And we hope that in the not too distant future, he'll be able to do that. Any further questions, Mr. Hastings? Mr. Hastings. Mr. Norwood said he isn't writing the bill. He isn't going to be here at 2 o'clock in the morning and ain't coming at 9. So I don't know what it is you're talking about him getting back to work. He's working right now. Let's go back to where I started, Mr. Chairman. I started by saying I could not ask Mr. Norwood, Dr. Norwood, Dr. Gansky, or uh, Mr. Dingle. I didn't know Mr. Barry was going to be here. I said I couldn't ask them intelligent questions because I did not have the amendment to the base bill. Let me clear something up right quick here. My good friend, Mr. Sessions, wants and did correctly in my judgment pat Dr. Norwood on his back for the extraordinary work that he's done. This base bill that was filed July 19th starts with Mr. Gansky's name. I want to pat Dr. Gansky on the back for the work that he has done along with Dr. Norwood in a bipartisan fashion. I equally want to especially pat John Dingle on the back for trying to keep this focused as well as Mr. Barry for the work that he has done. Let me ask you all something. There's an impact on the federal judiciary that, and the state uh, courts that I don't know was <coughs> con uh, uh, contemplated by you all. In the extraordinary hearings that you all had throughout the years, did you have federal and state court judges appear before you, and did you question them regarding any impact this would have on either uh, aspect of the judiciary in this country? The answer to that question is no. Then you would agree, Mr. Ding, that when people are put in the position for medically reviewable decisions, this is the language. Uh, incidentally, Mr. Chairman, where did this come from? This White thing House, we the White House. The White House uh, submitted that to us. Thank you very kind. It, it, this document submitted by the White House that Mr. Norwood nor Mr. Dangle or Mr. Gansky, Dr. Gansky had seen until they got here. Um, it says in the second sentence, picking up from where Mr. Frost left off and where Ms. Slaughter went, for medically reviewable decisions, cases against employers may be removed to federal court by the defendant. John, do you know of any situation that abrogates the rights of individuals to remove, if they can, a case to federal court? Here, the defendant can, <coughs> and the plaintiff can't. Is that what this language is saying? Uh, I, I'm afraid to say the answer to that question is yes. So then, cases against health insurers will be heard in state court, subject to the new federal law, which none of you all know 
what it is likely to uh, 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 be. And I want to share with you that when we do things like this, I've heard this word unfunded mandates ever since I've been in Congress. When we pass legislation without contemplating the impact on the judiciary, what we wind up doing is causing the rights of civil litigants to be impacted in a way that we don't quite understand. One of the reasons for the removal of cases to federal court is the independence of the federal judiciary, such that the federal judiciary is not swayed by the loudest opinion that might be out there that doesn't follow the precedent or doesn't have the clarity to understand the dynamics of issues. Thus, the opportunity is presented for the parties to determine if they can go to federal court. Now, in Miami at one time, Lincoln Diaz Ballard and I lived there during the days of the cocaine cowboys. Every federal judge was tied up in a criminal case. Civil litigants couldn't get heard in federal court. And what they wound up doing is going to state court. Now we have a situation where the defendant can simply say, if that arises in any jurisdiction in this country, that I'm going to remove um, not my case to the federal court because the civil litigant won't be heard. And quadriplegics and countless people who have problems will go unattended. Mr. Dingell, I wanted to ask you another question. You've had universal health language for as long as I've come here, and I read about it before I got here. What, if anything, does this legislation do for the 40 million uninsured people in America today? Well, as you very well know, I desperately want to get all of those people covered. The answer is, this doesn't do anything. This deals with a different problem, and that is it sees that those who are getting coverage do get the coverage for which they are paying or for which somebody else is paying. Uh, I've heard a lot of complaints that this doesn't take care of the uncovered. Uh, I have to say that, that I, I would love to cover them. But the, the simple fact of the matter is that this is not a piece of legislation and it, and it, and in which be, we can do it that. It may be off the point, and I understand that dynamic. Dr. Norwood, were you moved, I'll come back to you, Dr. Gansky, were you moved most by, and, and, and you and I rode the train the other day, and I was so impressed when you told me, and I forget who the other member was, that what you wanted to try to do, I asked you, Charlie, how's the bill coming along? And you say, what I want to do is to try to get something that the president will sign. All right? I have no quarrel with that. And yes, the president must be a player. But were you moved by the caps the one and a half million dollar cap, which ideologically you and I would disagree on, but I understand that. Or did you take into consideration in your uh, discussions with him all of these uh, causes of actions that are going to change, all of the designated decision maker, the class action limitations, uh, or was it the damage limits that moved you the most uh, uh, to make the arrangement that you had every right uh, uh, to make and you to be complimented for? Thank you, Judge. I think there were probably two areas of great concern that I felt I didn't know how we were going to get by and get this legislation signed. One of it was indeed the limitation of damages. There's no, I mean, he said that enough. I'm a believer uh, that he meant that. And the other part of that was the federal cause of action for the denial of benefits, which I've spent a lot of time talking with them down there since February trying to get us to a resolution and the uniformity in that was just so overwhelming for them that I knew I mean I believed in my soul that if we didn't make some accommodation there and we went ahead in the morning and we passed our bill which I'm not faulting our bill I wished we could have and had been taken up and signed, but if we'd passed that out, one of two possibilities were going to occur. We were going to get into a conference similar to the one that Mr. Dingell and I and, Gr and Dr. Gansky went through in 1999 and get nowhere, or if you were out able to slam it out of there, it was going to get a veto. Right. And I'm trying to find a way. 
I That's respect all that Dr. Is. Gansky wanted to respond, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate your patience. Don't mean to bother you all, but I'm going to tell you no, something. No, you're not, not bothered at all. What we're, we're very doing, happy to have you what here, we're and we're doing happy that you're raising these questions, wrong. Mr. Hastings. Mr. Hastings, I did want to point out that uh, in our base bill, we do have access provisions to help people afford health insurance in sections 511, 512, and 513. We have expanded uh, availability of uh, Archer MSAs. Some agree with it, some don't. But we also have something that nearly everyone agrees with, and that's 100% uh, uh, deductibility of health insurance uh, for the self-employed, making yeah, that effective pretty soon. And we also have some credits for health insurance uh, expenses for that's small... That's in the base bill. For, that's in the base bill. If your question was specifically directed to Mr. Norwood's amendment, then um, then I would agree with you. Thank yeah, you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Thank Chairman. You, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Norwood, surely. Mr. Hastings, what Dr. Gansky read out was about access for people who don't have presently health care insurance. Now, I'm probably the only one in here, but I'm excited about getting that signed and put into law. And now what we know is that there is no disagreement on that provision of access and that provision of access will get signed. There's nobody to fuss. And I'm excited about that. Now, hopefully we can work this other out and get the whole package put together so for the first time in 30 years, uh, people will actually have a remedy. They can choose their own doctor, for God's sake. There can be basic standards in, in health care. Uh, and that we can have an external review panel for the normal average American to appeal to, to independent physicians. I mean, that's big stuff compared to where we are today and what we have. Am I rolling the dice to get this baby signed? Sure as heck I am, because I've lived through this business of just sitting there is it eating cookies? I, I wasn't on the other conference committee, but it was eating, eating cookies and drinking. I mean, I don't want us to do that again, and that's all I'm trying to do here. Yes, thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mrs. Myrick. Hey, Mr. Chairman, I think we've adequately plowed this ground over and over and over again, very frankly, and um, I just want to identify myself with the comments of Mr. Linder and thank the four gentlemen for all the hard work that they've done, because I know it's been a labor of love for all of you and a little bit of frustration, too. Thank you very much. Mr. Sessions. Mr. Chairman, I've really said my piece already. It's my hope, and I think every member on this side and I think on that side wants to make sure that we have an opportunity to see what uh, Dr. Norwood wants to present. I think we're going to have time. I'm not in a hurry, and I think Friday, from my, in my opinion, is plenty of time. Tomorrow's Thursday and Friday, and that will give us plenty of time to get our work done and to be able to hear this case on the floor of the House and then vote and then go home and do the right thing, and then Tim Russert won't have anything to talk about. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Sessions. Let me say to all the panelists, uh, thank you very much for spending a great deal of time with us uh, on this issue. We have a series of votes downstairs. We wish you well, Mr. Norwood, as you begin your work uh, right now, and uh, that will conclude this panel. Uh, we will reconvene just as the uh, last in this series of votes begins, and uh, we'll begin with the panel, uh, including Mr. Boehner, and uh, Mr. Johnson, and with that, the committee stands in recess. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr.
This House Rules Committee hearing has been working to set guidelines for debate on managed health care legislation. Members are now taking a break for a series of votes in the House on President Bush's energy plan. We'll return to live coverage of this hearing when it resumes. In the meantime, we're going to show you some of the events from today on managed health care legislation. First, we'll take you to the White House, where President Bush announced an agreement on the issue with Georgia Republican Charles Norwood. Congressman Norwood is the sponsor of one of the leading managed health care bills in the House.